So welcome to this week's CMC Markets Weekly Outlook webinar. Just on the old risk warning screen at the moment. Um, let's have a read through that and then we can get started. Well, might just jump immediately to um, one of the first notable moves that's happening in the markets at the moment is we're getting a big jump in oil prices and that could well feed through to um, higher stock markets today. Obviously, the drop in oil prices has been hit the energy sector pretty hard, particularly in the uh, uh, the FTSE and the, and the Dow Jones, um, the, the UK 100 and US 30. So uh, this is definitely an interesting development. We're about 4% higher on Brent, 3% odd higher on WTI. Um, this is the kind of short-term situation. Uh, this is in, in WTI. So we obviously, we've been bumping into this base at about $44. Um, since that low was formed on the 13th, and so, you know, the you know in these situations the trend is down, so you've got to uh, assume you don't have to, but it, it's logical to assume that the trend is going to continue, and that this line will break. Um, but when you get that kind of acceleration to the upside, uh, particularly through a key barrier like 45, um, and then this um, you know this kind of resistance area that's been formed here in the mid part of this range. Um, as well as this declining trend line in the short term, um, then you have to sit up and take notice and think, well, perhaps we're in for a, a larger correction here from this downtrend, and so you've got to shift your bias at that point. Um, so there was the indications here of a bottoming process. You assume it's not going to be a bottom, but you're certainly aware of the possibility, definitely given the extent of the declines we've seen already. And now we are just bumping into this uh, this kind of, you know, you can see we had a couple of hits on this um, 49-ish type area, and that's that's what we've kind of run into at the moment. So this could be deemed a uh, sort of horizontal range. This is a bit of a an issue there, um, but otherwise this would make sense as a, as a kind of price range. So we've seen quite a large move, so we might be in for a bit of a correction from this kind of level since it has potentially been just part of this range, and we certainly can't outrule the possibility that this is just a kind of bare flag where this is the pole and you know this is the sideways flag and then we just drop again definitely a distinct possibility um, but a lot of people are looking for uh, the base in oil prices so this is WTI just looking at that short-term picture um, but what I think is is perhaps more interesting is if we just have a look at uh, Brent what I got here is the uh, the longer term picture so this is our monthly chart this is not necessarily a particularly valid trend line. It only has two touches, but nevertheless, quite interesting how last month's January's candlestick actually managed to close just about on or above this rising trend line. And um, if we kind of zoom in on this this candlestick a bit, you can see it it did close over halfway from the uh, the, the range of the candle, which is. Not, you know, it didn't close right at the open um, or right at the high, which would be a stronger reversal signal. But nonetheless, definitely the indication of some kind of selling here, and also the fact that we closed above this key 50 level in Brent, which is obviously the sort of internationally followed contract for oil. Then, um, you know, both, both a couple of key technical developments there that um, could be the beginnings of a, a bottoming process. Interesting to look back at 2008 when we did this last massive plummet. You know, we had a bit of a kind of stronger reversal signal there where you can see prices drop right down and closed up with a very small body. And then we had a couple of months of just kind of going sideways, doing nothing before making our way right back up again. So that could be what we're looking at here. We've already seen it somewhat in the short term. We were just in a sort of horizontal range. That was the thing we were looking at um, in WTI, but very much similar in, um, in Brent. This kind of choppy formation, we could just be looking at that on a kind of, um, you know, just on a longer time frame. So more of these kind of sideways type markets where we're going to see weeks of just up and down, you know, up maybe up to 60 even find some resistance there, down again to 50, may get a bit of that before we kind of work out the next direction. So certainly brave if you're uh, buying in here for the long term, 
could certainly pay off. We haven't got all the evidence yet that this is a bottom fundamentally um, still oversupplied and under demanded in terms of oil. But um, you know the the fundamentals do tend to show themselves after the technical picture takes place. So that's the nature of. So that's oil. But really the, the sort of general focus for um for markets at the moment, um particularly when we're looking at the indices, is quantitative easing from the European Central Bank. Um I think there's little doubt that that has been the main catalyst for why European markets are one of their best months in years in January, whereas uh US markets were somewhat lackluster and actually uh closed down in the end, um in a pretty disappointing month. <coughs> You know, if you look at the difference economically, yes, the U.S. saw massive growth in Q3 and a, you know, a bit of a drop off, but we only just got that data. There were some signs that there was a slowdown, but you know, what else are you really going to do except slow down a bit from a 5% expansion? So economically, the U.S. still looking really a lot better than than Europe. Yet the European equities are massively outperforming. European equities are pretty undervalued compared to the U.S. So there's an element of the new year. Um, Fund managers looking at what uh, what the valuations are across various sectors, various countries, and shifting things around according to where they think there is value. Um, and so, when you have the combination of quantitative easing, so massive stimulus from a central bank, and um, um, you know, and <coughs> uh, valuations look a bit more favourable, then uh, you know that might be two key reasons for, for switching into to European stocks and so that's why when we look over at the uh, the Germany 30 you know, we've seen this massive rally and so um, this was the kind of triangle formation that I alluded to um, a couple of weeks ago really it was around here so well, yeah a couple of weeks ago and so we've hit that 100% target almost perfectly so the 100% Basically, came just shy of the 10800, and it was that 10800 basically that um, ended up being the resistance. And now we're just kind of travelling sideways, um, trying to uh, break to the upside or um, failing that, break to the downside. Now we've got some, you know, small. Um, this is more evident on short term, but a, a small bit of a um, negative divergence here in the RSI according to these peaks. But that peak, to be fair, is lower. I mean, it's it's basically flat, but this one's distinctly lower. So a small sign that we could get risk some risk to the downside. Um, it may, you know, obviously QE is going to be, you know, it's going to be an increasing factor, and it's not like it's all priced in. You know, the more, especially when QE actually physically starts making its mark, and 60 billion euros gets um, pumped into the. Um, you know, into equities and the eurozone economy, etc. Then, the, you know, we're going to see the sort of physical effects on markets. But um, this is all expectation of at the moment. So I think we've still got some room to go um, on the upside. But you know, the situation in Greece, which is um, fairly prominent at the moment, you know, that could be the cause for a kind of correction, perhaps to this small consolidation area that we saw here around the sort of 10 300 mark that's a that's a definite possibility and that to me looks about 50 percent of that move I haven't um. <coughs> so you can see here we're basically at that 23 percent at the moment um, 38.2 is a bit in the middle of nowhere this the bottom of this consolidation area is, is the 50 percent so in this sort of zone um, especially with the 21-day moving average coming into there, could could act as support should we break this current level. So if we zoom down into the four-hour, we can see this is a, a possible double top, and we've got the the negative divergence alongside it. So sh basically, the confirmation of this pattern would be a slip through this 23.6% Fibo level around that sort of 10.560. That would be our trigger for um, going short. Um, if that were deemed to be a uh, double top pattern, um, but for the moment, again, you know the trend is, is higher, so you've got to assume it's probably a consolidation pattern, but it certainly could be a, a double top. Um, with that kind of zone here being a um, an area that might attract some interest, the euro has been a somewhat sort of different story. Um, 
And lastly, just sort of you know the the, the reaction from stocks and the uh, so the sort of pre um, the pre the, the moves that happened in markets prior to the ECB announcing quantitative easing and the moves afterwards have been a bit different from stocks and the euro. The euro basically was pricing it in beforehand and has um, basically sort of sold on the new uh, sold on the rumor and bought on the on the news where stocks kind of post facts have been uh, been rallying so if you look at the euro it's actually rebounded a bit in the last week or so this is the uh the monthly picture which i think is sort of worth worth bearing in mind you know this potentially is a sort of pretty downward sloping channel so we've had three touches on the top that's valid these two yeah, sort of um you know sort of match up and so if we were to touch the bottom of that channel it would be just above that sort of um that parity mark that a lot of people have their eye on and would just be along the lines of this the top of this consolidation pattern depending on how long it takes to get there but this is obviously a pretty long term picture so it's not to say we can't get some kind of bounces in the meantime and it looks like we are in the midst of one at the moment and I think a key level you can see this line that we've got here is about a sort of 1640 ish when we drop down to the daily chart you can see that's here that could be something that we're looking at should we break through this downward sloping trend line so it doesn't look too good I mean, it's just a very sharply declining trend line because of the extent of the move on the daily chart looks a bit more reasonable on the four hour chart and so this is the line through this peak here. Tr couple of attempted breaks here and a, and a breakdown. So maybe it's going to make it this time. We're basically testing the 55 period moving average on the four hour and that declining trend line. And this sort of 1270 is holding up pretty well. Um, you know, whether we can break above that may somewhat depend on the, um, the PMIs that we see this week. Um, We've seen some already um, in terms of manufacturing. Uh, on Wednesday, we've got more in terms of services, which are obviously a larger contributor towards the uh, uh, Eurozone output. Um, but as far as European data, it's, it's a little bit on the limited side. And we saw we had the two big, uh, you know, the big events uh, with the Fed last week. So when you're looking at the kind of euro against the dollar, it may be the kind of dollar end of things that drives things. And uh, the big one this week, as it is the first week of the month, is obviously non-farm payrolls. And, uh, and that's on Friday. And, bear, and keep in mind, obviously, we've got our non-farm payrolls webinar. So you can follow along live with the event if you're, uh, if you're able to do so. So drivers of this, you know, it's, it's a bit uncertain exactly how things are going to play out uh, with Greece. Um, well, very uncertain. Um, you know, should we suddenly move towards a world in which um, the new anti-austerity party, uh, Syriza and Greece, um, are really playing a sort of difficult ball game and um, really fighting hard um, to the extent that um, it's just not anywhere near something the likes of Germany or Finland or some of these opponents to cutting back um, the, you know, giving the giving the Greeks a sort of a, a haircut on their debt. Um, so it, you know, if it gets to the extent where it's just there's going to be no sense of agreement, um, then you know there are there's going to be the valid worry for markets that Greece is just going to drop out of the eurozone. Um, doesn't matter so much about Greece, but it does matter for the kind of general validity of the whole structure of the eurozone. Um, you know, if Greece drops out, who's to say that um, that Spain or Italy won't be next? So that's a distinct downward risk, to, I would say downward risk to the euro. Um, but on the upside, we do have, um, you know, the possibility of uh, non-farm payrolls perhaps coming under what had been uh, previously hoped. We've seen a bit of a slowdown in the fourth quarter in terms of growth. We've had a few numbers for January which weren't quite so up to scratch. So maybe a, a number below the sort of 220 odd that's been expected that could be the catalyst to push the euro higher but th technically this trend line is the first point and we're bumping right into it at the moment so this the area that this can go you know, this might be the first to give the support 
maybe another move lower before a break higher. So keep an eye on the, on these two lines. Break up from one or the other gives a bit of space above and below. We've got this this low here, but uh, you know, given that this had a couple more touches, I, I would point to one about the sort of one one five fifty ish, one more five forty five has been the kind of more important area I would say on the upside. Now we do obviously have the uh, Bank of England this week, um, so we may as well have a look at um, sterling. So this picture was sterling, obviously fairly, um, you know, fairly uh, bearish looking chart, um, just you know an obvious downtrend. Um, if we pull back, we can see these are the two horizontal lines that have just the um, that was an important area, and we've really failed three times to get back above there. And to me, it would be logical for us to go and rechallenge this uh, 148.40-ish, these lows from uh, 2013, especially after that, you know, that last week's um, candle. That's quite a strong move from those highs down lower again. So, and you know, obviously. Large amount of this is uh, is dollar strength, but recently we've seen some more kind of bearish indications for the uh, for the pound. <coughs> excuse me, uh, just because inflation has dropped so much alongside the price of oil, that there's um, you know that alongside falling wages uh, or limited wage growth, then um, it's uh, it's just not as much reason for the Bank of England to hike rates as there once was. You know, the other thing being that the you know the housing market was on fire. Uh, now it's cooled somewhat, given some of the other regulations that have been put in. So, you know, without that kind of housing market uh, bubble risk, without the inflation wage risk, um, you know, the unemployment numbers are sort of ticking along nicely. But uh, there are some other indications that the economy is not going as strongly as it could. Um, a lot of people, myself included, just say it's healthy to raise rates to a sort of more normal level. Um, but, you know, looking at sort of the way the central bankers tend to work, normally a bit behind the curve, quite frankly, um, <coughs> uh, you know, we, we could be on for no rate hike from the Bank of England in, in 2015, uh, and that's pretty bearish for the pound. But um, you know, on a short-term note, you, know, you can see where we've been bumping into on the, on the top and the bottom side. And this is the low to keep, you know, obviously to, to keep an eye on. For a moment, we're in the range. So overall, quite an obvious downtrend as we saw on the daily chart. So buying at the bottom of the range is definitely distinctly more risky than selling at the top of the range. Um, but you know, when you dip down to there, some potential value. But um, you know, don't be surprised if we break through it. It is a downtrend after all. So that the Bank of England meeting. You know, probably not much to be expected there. Um, uh, you know, it's going to be a uh, another one of those sort of um, um, you know, just nothing. You know, it's just going to be no change announced. But you have to consider that the backdrop of the last meeting was that two of those hawks, dissenting hawks, um, that had voted for a rate hike, they pulled back. Um, so probably what's behind this no change in policy is probably a unanimous decision not to change policy, which is, um, you know, the transition towards a natural rate hike would be people start to descend, more people start to descend, and then there's a majority for hiking rates. Um, but you know, at the moment, it's unanimous for keeping it the same. Uh, but we won't know that till the minutes are later. Um, so yeah, probably not much to be seen from that um, from that Bank of England report. Yeah, the um, inflation report, monthly inflation report, I think from the Bank of England is uh, maybe next week. Probably should have double checked that. Um, ah, it is. Yep, next Thursday will be more, uh, much more interesting for the outlook of the British pound. And that, given that is the case. Um, you know, sort of uh, U.S. jobs report aside, you know that might be reason why we stay in a bit of a sort of range-bound type of conditions, and maybe does increase the um, the probabilities from buying at the bottom of this range. 
given that we've got such an important event next week um, for the for the pound. Um, while we're on the currency front, um, you'll notice here in the insight section, obviously we've got things pumping out here all the time, um, but particularly of note is that we've got, um, doo -doo -doo, it should be here, I'm not seeing it, oh, maybe it's been pulled. Basically, on the uh, on the website, I'll make sure to know an update here. Maybe I'm just going blind, but um, there's a uh, report that we have on the uh, the upcoming RBA meeting, which is basically sort of tonight for us. Um, basically, uh, well, sort of early hours <coughs> um, RBA meeting. And so, if we have a look at the Australian dollar. I see your question about Tesco there, Sanji. Yep, I'll, um, I'll have a little look at that um, just after this. Um, Move the wrong trend line there. So, this is the sort of general conditions we've got the Aussie on the daily chart, strongly down, obviously. This was the big support level that we busted through. But as you can see, we're now sitting on this 200 month um, moving average. So, in the short term, that's capable of giving us a little lift, but you can see not really too much signs of a bounce on the monthly chart there, having hit that moving average pretty much closed at the lows in a very bearish looking candlestick. So not looking too good for the Aussie, and um, some of the reason behind that is obviously, well, a lot of the reason is the dollar strength. That's a given for any of these dollar pairs, um, barely worth mentioning at this point, but uh, specifically towards the Aussie. Um, we do have this RBA meeting and the risk of a um, an outside surprise from the RBA. Um, Governor Stevens over there may may chuck a, a little rate hike in there, um, following along from from China having done the same. Obviously, China is a big demander of the um, Australian commodities, so the Aussie dollar is really being hit particularly hard, alongside um, falling uh, copper copper iron ore and oil prices. It's not a big oil exporter, but they're just general slump in commodities is um, is not good for the Aussie. Arguably good for the Australian economy, for their exports, um, but if the reason for the decline in the, trend li uh, in the exchange rate is because their export markets are suffering, that's not really a good thing. So it's all cyclical. At some point, the, the drop in prices will make their uh, commodities desirable enough for people to buy more, but you know we're not quite at that stage yet. So, not as you can see from that uh, from that uh, long-term outlook chart, not much cause um, in terms of support for uh, for buying. So, really, a matter of kind of pinpointing your um, your shorts at this point until there is some evidence of a uh, a bottoming back. <coughs> and uh, you know, certainly not unknown for a bottom pattern to happen away from a sort of major support level. And I guess what this is potentially support from this uh, moving average and uh, we've got that spike reversal there um, a bit below prices so yeah we certainly could bottom out it but um, <coughs> my suspicion is having broken that we could see uh, we got an amount further to go perhaps down to the top of this consolidation area down around one around 71 so that you know that'd be a thousand points lower from that break that we had <coughs> now we're not as regular on our um, chart updates on Tesco, but have to been a bit more recently. I think I did one after the last earnings report. Mm -hmm. hmm. No, strange. I thought I did a more recent one. <coughs> well, instructive to pull it out to the. Um, Longer term charts, I think the weekly probably serves a bit better. This is basically a pretty classic double bottom we've had in Tesco's. Um, it's just I'm surprised it didn't. I think there's also a um, 
either a double bottom or a, um, a head and shoulders that's taken place in Sainsbury's. So maybe it was that that I put on the chart for him. <coughs> but yeah, certainly a bit of a bounce taking place in all of these supermarkets. And I think probably what we're um, seeing here is this consolidation area. You know, this one, you know, that's where that's this gap that we had um, temporarily stopped prices on that week. But then you can see this area has made it had a bigger effect. And last week we um, we closed down and yeah, a pretty weak bearish engulfing candlestick um, on Tesco didn't really close the low. The, bo the, the, the bottom of the body was not really below the previous week, but still, you know, a pretty kind of bearish looking candlestick. You know, you'd want to see the break of the uh, low of the um, week before last to give yourself a bit more of an indication that um, things are overdone on the upside. <coughs> Um, if you're looking for another opportunity to buy um, Tesco's, you know you think we put in the low, then uh, if we can get down to this, you know this peak again, you know it would only, it would only be natural for around that 200 mark, but I think 197 maybe more specifically. Yeah, 197.40. You know that would that be a definite potential area that some people will be looking at for, for buying into Tesco's. But, you know, we may not get down that low. It has got strong momentum now. In the shorter term, some signs that, uh, you know, this, you know, obviously I drew, I drew this, you know, it's a good example of just how, you know, small things on the, on the daily chart that barely seem to match on a daily chart, you can see are acting as um, support on the shorter time frames. You know, we came up, bumped up against it, caused a few spiked above, couldn't close, eventually did gap above it, came into that um, daily 200-day moving average, and now we've found support back at that level back there. So this could hold as support. It's not been a particularly large correction. You know, maybe this this big spike higher out of the range could be another area if you're not keen to wait down to 197 could be another area to get in on Tesco's if it breaks if it breaks 241 then you get into the you know you get into the stage where so here's one just kind of dis the way I kind of distinguish um, targeting the support and resistance is that if you're in a downtrend where you're forming, you know, lower lows, lower highs, then the bounces back should, if it's a healthy downtrend, find resistance at the prior support areas. If you've broken that downtrend, as perhaps we arguably have, then it no longer would actually be the supports like, you know, like this would be a kind of logical support that we're holding up and then broke through big time. You know, if this was if the downtrend was still intact, say we only dropped down to here or something, and then it bounced up to there, that would be a, a buying opportunity, uh, a selling opportunity. But the fact that we've kind of come down, based out, broken through a high, made a higher high, potentially will make a higher low, and then move up to there, to me would mean that actually it wouldn't so much be the base, it would be the high, because it's a failure to make a new higher high, which would put an end to the um you know to the uptrend if that makes sense so you know when we're um when we're looking at areas from the prior trend to use as targets if the if the if the downtrend's still intact we use the supports but if the downtrend's been broken we use the resistances test that out if you don't believe me but um it ten tends to be the way things play out <coughs> So in answer to that question, I would I would put it north of three and three hundred is obviously a big round number, uh, and then just north of that about three twelve. <coughs> okay. Um, any other markets people would like me to cover? Um, certainly, let me know. I've sort of um, deviated around a little bit. I guess the, the UK one hundred would be a logical one. Um, 
this is the longer term picture we're in this channel now we've, we've come off quite strongly off the bottom of this channel not even we haven't even reached the bottom of the channel a couple of times and that's quite a strong signal we broke through this massive sell-off that we had so that's strong signal but so far we haven't got through the 6900 the top of the channel so broadly speaking when you're in a channel the, the lower risk opportunities are to the buy towards the bottom of the channel sell towards the top so we're at the obviously close to the top the lower risk opportunities tend to be sells uh, tend to be going short but you know if you believe that the European quantitative easing program is going to feed through into UK equities then that would mean that we're going to get a break higher so the risk obviously obviously of going short at the top of the range is that we break high but that's the nature of you know whenever you you know you're doing a range trade you're buying at the bottom selling at the top the risk is we break out we've been in this range for a while so the longer it takes the longer this range takes place the each time you buy or sell from the top of the uh, bottom of the top you know the bigger the risk that it, that's the time that it breaks out <coughs> But if you have so far been selling at the top here and buying at the bottom, then you're already ahead. And when it finally does break, well, that'll be you know a, a loss or a break-even trade. You know, take it on the chin, and then you can start going with the trend once it's broken. But to me, that's the uh, the major catalyst here because um, UK economy is ticking along, but it has been for a year or so. Um, arguably, it's declined a little bit in the, in the past six months. Uh, but it's probably just going to be quantitative easing from the eurozone that would be the the reason for the UK breaking higher, just chasing the DAX higher. Uh, quick note on gold. Um, So here's where we are. This is how I'm looking at things. One of the more clear cut charts. To me, this was an inverse head and shoulders pattern. We've got a strong breakout from, hit 300, we've corrected down to the 21 day moving average. We've seen a bounce from there. So, you know, we're always at critical junctures, but this is particularly one where, um, you know, if we break through that 21 moving average, then the next logical support would be down towards the, um, you know, the uh, the neckline of the pattern, and that's not really good. If you move a good away for a good amount of distance away from the neckline, but then come and test it again before having reached the target, it's an indication the target is just not going to get reached. For now, um, I'm still looking towards this target of, um, you know, that is the height of the pattern, and then from the breakout area, that is the um, the objective. 100% objective of that that height from that breakout area, and it does correspond pretty perfectly with that with that peak. So it's that sort of 1340. Um, and uh, so you know the trend is higher for now. We're in the midst of a correction. Um, we've bounced quite strongly from that um, moving average, and we're just dipping a bit now. So you know if you believe that this low is going to hold somewhere in the space of last week's um, candlestick is become, going to become a increasingly better value to buy somewhere in there and obviously if you're buying right at the low then just minimal risk if you have your stop loss somewhere close below the low so that's um, yeah that's really the you know, that's kind of the main focus for myself um, pattern wise and gold um, you know, the um, I did do a um, I did uh, the, the last couple of um, snapshots that I've done uh, snapshots of the um, video updates normally the last sort of two three four minutes um, the last couple I've done have been on gold so you can see a bit more in depth as some of the uh, the fundamental reasons for for um, for gold in those um, so if there is a what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch off the recording. Um, thank you very much for, for attending. Um, should there be any further questions, I'm happy to um, to answer those questions after the end of the uh, the official recording. So I'll stay online, wait for any more questions. But uh, you know, if I don't get any, 
Thanks very much for attending and good luck with the, the week's trading.